All right, well, welcome to my first lecture in quantitative finance. So, uh, did you, could you access the slides on Moodle? Who could not access the slides on Moodle? Yeah. So, first of all, I would like to know who of you has taken Econometrics 1? Okay, good, good. Yeah, so many, many of the concepts that we will dis discuss during this course are actually related to Econometrics 1, so that's, that's why it was a, um, like a compulsory course for that course here, yeah, because everything that we do here and that we discuss will actually build upon the knowledge from, that you acquired in Econometrics 1, but we will of course repeat uh, those things that are of major importance here in that course. So, first of all, in order to get started, I would like to discuss some basics of capital market theory that we need for that course, so just that everybody here is on the same, on the same boat, so to speak. Yeah? Let's assume we have an investor that has a set of N stocks to choose from, or assets, and these N assets can be allocated in the mean variance space. Yeah? So let's assume furthermore that the statistical properties of those assets can be described by their mean and by their volatility, or respectively their variance or standard deviation. So the first and the second moment. Then you can ask, what is the optimal portfolio in this return, risk return space? We know from the 61 paper respectively the 64 paper from Sharp, Trainer, Lindner, who introduced the capital asset pricing model. Uh, we know we have seen this efficient frontier at an earlier time in, from our undergraduate studies, I suppose. Yeah. So we have many different assets in our stock universe or our asset universe. Yeah. Let's say we have stocks. And when we can com combine them, and what we get is this efficient frontier, yeah? where we have on the, on the x-axis the risk, yeah? or the, the standard deviation, and on the y-axis we have the expected return of the excess returns of assets i and i is from 1 to n. Yeah? So we, what we also know is that south from this minimum variance portfolio, this, this part here, we would not invest in. So we would not invest on everything that is here below the minimum variance portfolio. Yeah. Because the expected return is, is lower for each unit of risk. So we, we only would invest into combinations of portfolios that are above the, mid, the minimum variance portfolio. So and we can also ask, okay, a rational investor, how would he or she invest? So he or she would of course maximize the sharp ratio. So she wants to have or he wants to have the, the maximum return for each given unit of risk. And in our mean variance space here, it's maybe probably some, somewhere like here. Yeah. Here is the steepest the steepest, if you would uh, basically write the tangency portfolio, we have here the, the optimal relationship between risk and return. This tangency portfolio, you remember that. Yeah. And here on the y axis, we would have the risk free rate. Yeah. So each rational investor would basically invest into this market portfolio. And here, this is called the market portfolio. That's denoted by capital M. And depending on your own subjective preference function, you would either, you could leverage this, this position by investing here. You would take a leverage of this market portfolio. Or if you are very risk averse, you, know, you could also choose this position here, where you choose less of, of, of one unit of your, or less of 100% of your wealth. Um, you would invest less of 100% of your wealth into the market portfolio. And would, pop, and would put something on, the, on, your, on your bank account. 
Yeah. This, this, the second decision depends on your own on individual preferences, whereas the first decision depends upon rationality. Yeah. This is something. This is nothing new. This is something that we know already from our under, undergraduate studies. So in this theoretical framework, every market participator would invest in this market portfolio, yeah, which gives us the, the best or the optimal relationship between risk and return. So the cap M then assumes that all, all stocks or all assets are priced according to the sensitivity or the loading against the market risk factor. So everything that matters in our CAPM world is the market portfolio. And the return of asset I at time T depends on the risk free rate plus the beta, which is the sensitivity against market factor, times the excess returns of the market factor at time T, and an error term, which I denoted here in this notation as error IT. It's the error this is the error of stock I or asset I at time T. Of course, if you put this on the, the risk free rate on the left hand side, this is what you, should, what you usually do. Then we have the, here in a vector of excess returns. And on the right hand side, as regressor, we have simply the excess returns of the market factor and this idiosyncratic term, this error term here. Yeah. So the standard equation that, that we know are the excess returns of asset I or stock I at time T depends solely on the beta loading against the market factor M in, in excess form at time T. And then we have also this idiosyncratic term, which is the error or the unsystematic part of the return vector at time T on asset I. So that's, in essence, the, what the CAPM would predict. Everything that matters is the market factor, and every stock is priced according to the sensitivity or the core movement with respect to the market factor. What we also know from the CAPM, if the market factor is everything that matters, there would be no systematic mispricing going on. So if we would include in this regression an intercept term, let's call it alpha i, and we would run the estimation, the regression model, this guy here, the intercept term, should be on average zero. It should be statistically not, not be different from zero if the CAPM holds. And we are talking about that a lot in our RFM course, if you remember. Then in order to make it a little bit more intuitive, what's, what's going on here, here I have downloaded some data. It's the S&P 500. And the data series is from 92 to 2014. Yeah. And what you see here is the evolution of the S&P 500 over time. Yeah. It starts from 92. And uh, what we see here in the period from, let's say, 92 in the early, in the early 90s until 2000, we see a huge increase in the S&P 500. Yeah? So if you Google it a little bit what has happened here, this was the formation of the so-called dot-com bubble. Yeah? In the late 90s, especially technology stocks and uh, telecom stocks and internet stocks, they increased in prices. So they, they were basically responsible for this sharp increase in stock prices in the, early, in the late 90s until 2000. So this is, this is the price series. If you would estimate the return series, yeah, so the changes in prices, that the returns are changes in prices, so the average return in this period here of the S&P 500 is positive. Yeah. The stock market returns of the S&P 500 in this period would have been positive. No, because the stock prices were increasing. 
You, I could have plot the same a graph for the stock exchange here in, in, in Finland for the OMIX 25, same thing. Or for the German stock index, the DAX, DAX 30, same thing. But since the market, the market capitalization is the highest for the uh, US index here, I, I chose the, the US in, in index for our illustrative purpose here. So then, uh, around 2000, the dot-com bubble burst. Uh, stock prices were falling, not only in the US, but also everywhere in the world. Uh, also, in Finland, you might remember, or maybe you don't remember, but you can ask your parents, they might tell you, Nokia, uh, which, which, which was basically the pride of the Finnish nation, that super high stock prices in 2000, but, it, but then it crashed. The same thing happened to the Deutsche Telekom in Germany. So telecom, telecom stocks they crashed. And what we see here is a sharp decline in stock prices in the period from 2000 to, let's say, 2000, late 2003. So if you would, have, if you would estimate the stock returns, this, this are again prices, so the market return in this period here was negative. So positive, negative. Then stock prices were decreasing again in, two, in the 2004 period, 2004 under 2000 and let's say seven. Again, the average stock market return in this sample period here was positive. The same in Germany, the same in Finland and in most Western countries, same thing, summer yeah. Then we, have, we had this financial crisis period. Again, you could consult your parents, they might tell you. In, in 2000 and late 2007, it, it actually has started the mortgage crisis yeah. and the bank stocks. This time, the bank stocks were responsible for the crash. Yeah. In October 2008, as far as I remember, um, was the, the more or less the peak of the financial crisis when Lehman Brothers, this huge U.S. investment bank, was, uh, went bankrupt. Yeah. So this was this period here, let's say late 2007 until, let's say, March 2009. Again, if you would estimate the average return of the assembly period here is negative. And it's the same for all stock markets in the Western world. Yeah. And then again, we had the rebound yeah, in March, April 2009. From that period onwards, actually, stock prices were increasing. So the average market return for this period, for the fourth later period, again, was positive. And it still is, actually. The next crash has not happened yet. We are still waiting for that. Yeah? We're waiting to go short and to earn money. Yeah? So now we can ask, OK, we know okay, stock market return was, was positive here then it was negative in this period, then again positive, then negative, positive. Now we could ask, okay, but what about the beta? If the beta is always constant yeah, in our cap M, this is what the cap M actually suggests, if the beta is always the same, every stock should have the same evolution. It should have, on average, the same patterns, right? High, then decreasing, then again increasing, then decreasing. We should have seen, we should have seen or we should see the same patterns in the price evolution of the stocks, if the beta would be constant, right? So here, I depicted for our Finnish students Nokia, the stock price evolution of Nokia from the period 95 to 2014, almost the same period. So I, what I would like to illustrate here is again, this huge peak uh, in the early 2000s, when Nokia had the highest stock price notations, then the crash in the wake of the burst of the, of the dot-com bubble. Yeah? And then it it's slightly moved up again, but not with the same pace like here, obviously. The slope is, is much higher here than it is here. Yeah? This is the first thing. So if the beta would be the same, actually, we would expect that the slope here in the second formation of the second bubble would be basically the same like here, right? If the, beta is if the beta would be constant, and the cap M would be true. What we see then in the after, in the, in, in the ex-post financial crisis period, again a huge decline in stock prices, and since then onwards, Nokia went down. There was no recovery. And you can also plot any other telecom stock, not, not only Nokia, you, you could plot Telia Sonera, 
here in Finland or other telecom stocks around the world, there was no real recovery here. Yeah? Even though we remember now, actually the S&P 500 and also other, the most other stock markets, they went up again. So the average return of the stock market was positive, but the average return in this sample period of, the tele of uh, Nokia and other telecom stocks was negative. So if the beta was positive in the early sample period, that's obviously not true for the, for the later sample period, right? Intuitively. I mean, you can see it from the data, from the, just by steering long enough on this graph, you can see what, what's going on here, right? You don't need the big theory here. You can actually see it already. And that's also why econometrics is actually so fun if you work with it if you work with empirical data and so on and so forth. This is what you do the whole day, basically. You watch data and then you observe patterns in data without having like a big model or a big theory behind it. You can, many things you can just, just ob observe it from the data. Here we have uh, Telia Sonera. Yeah. Similar, similar issue here, again in the later, in the later period, we see that uh, here now the stock index, I have now here the Dow Jones, this is the red line, and the green line is again the S&P 500. In the end, in the later sample period, again, the stock index indices are increasing, of course, because the S&P was also increasing, and uh, Telia Sonera was also in a downwards movement. And in order to illustrate it a little bit better, I will now con restrict the sample period a little bit more, and I have now here the sample period from Jul July 2009 until February 2014. And here again, as benchmark, you have the red line, which is the Dow Jones index, and the green line, which is the S&P 500. Of course, they're highly correlated. They move in the, in the same direction. It must be like that. But then you see Telia Sonera, it was in a downwards movement. So the market beta was obviously here negative. Uh, the average return of the stock indices were positive, but Telia Sonera generated negative, a negative sample average return in this period. So the cool move of the beta in line with the cap M would have been negative if you would estimate it for the sample period. So it, it seems to be that different sample periods provide us different betas. So now we, we can already challenge our cap M model if it really does such a good job, even though the theory might be appealing, but in practice we see already here that there's something strange going on. So the beta does not seem to be like stable. It, se it seems to dry over time. But if the cat and would be, would be true, We could have estimated the so-called security market line. Yeah. This is the risk-free rate here. And on the y-axis, we have the, again, like here, the expected return of asset I in excess form, of course. And on the x-axis, we have the beta of asset I. So if the cap M is true and all assets would be priced according to the market beta and, and nothing else matters, then we would, we would think or we would, what we would see is that all the sample averages or all the expected returns of our assets should be somehow here on the security market line. So the sensitivity against market factor would predict the average return of the assets. Yeah. So if we are here, for instance, a beta of, let's say, let's say if this is 1.7, would predict an expected return that is so high. Yeah? This is the expected return of asset I given a beta is 1.7, very generally ex expressed here. So we could basically read the sample average or the expected returns of all these assets just by estimating the beta. Yeah. But how does it look in real life? 
If we, if we do that in real life, what we would probably get is that some assets would be here, so the expected returns are higher than predicted by the cap M. So the, they have a beta of, let's say, 1.5 or something. And the beta should be actually here according to the cap M, but the beta is much higher, it's, it's somewhere here. So the difference here that we see, the, the, the difference in expected return between the, what would be predicted by the cap M and what we actually measure, this is the mispricing. This is basically what we have here as denoted as the alpha. And we can do that for all these stocks in, in, in our universe. We can, I, I brought you two different possibilities here. Two different stock universe. And then I will ask you a question. Again, we have on the x-axis our betas, and on the y-axis, of course, our expected returns. Then we have the security market line, and an asset universe i. We get this kind of estimates here. So we estimate the betas, we rerun the cap m, and we estimate the corresponding betas, and we plot the sample averages of our assets here on the y-axis. So this is, this is our first universe, and this is our second universe here. In which of these asset universes is the cap M more likely to price the assets? We're talking about the GRS test in the RFM course, right? Do you remember that? I think some of you took the RFM course just, you know, so this would be pretty, it should be still in your memory somehow, I think. So if the differences between the security market line and the actual expected return or sample average, if the average across all of our stocks denotes the, the mispricing, then of course the mispricing is here in this universe much, much higher than here. So the GRS test, if you would implement the GRS test and we would test the, the alphas of, of, of all of our assets taken together, then in this case here, the GRS test would be highly likely be rejected. So our mispricing would be systematic. This is what we would conclude. And in this case here, it could be that the null hypothesis is not rejected, so that we would say, okay, in this case here, our cap M prices our test assets very well, on average, because the mispricing is on average probably around zero, since all of our assets line up on the, on the security market line. So here we have the huge mispricing going on, the cap M doesn't seem to work, but in this case, probably it does. This is what it tells us. So on the next slide, uh, in empirical work, we run OLS regressions uh, of this type that I have written here on the whiteboard. This is actually the type what we also would implement here. And if the cap M is true, you know, the alpha should be on average zero for our assets and now remember from our RFM course that usually the assets are correlated. These guys, our dependent variables here on the left hand side, they, the assets, if we have n assets, those n assets are likely to be correlated. Our point estimates, alpha, alpha hat and beta hat, are random variables because they are linear combinations of our assets here. So therefore, our alphas are also correlated. So if you run the GRS test, we have to account for that correlation actually, yeah? So of the covariance between the uh, estimated alphas. So what we also do in empirical work is, or what do, when you read all these research papers, as a 
proxy for the market factor, they usually employ sort of stock index. Yeah, in, in, in many papers, they use the CRISP index for the US uh, stock universe, or there are also many papers around the, uh, that use the S&P 500 as proxy for the market factor. So and then the question that I also was talking about in the RFM course is, mm, can we actually test the CAPM? Is the market index a good proxy for the market portfolio or for this optimal portfolio here? So I can, just in order to repeat what we went through also in the RFM course, is actually mm, if we use all of our assets that we use in order to construct our mean variance frontier, the ex post data or the, the, the sharp ratio of the optimal portfolio using all this data is usually higher than the sharp ratio of the S&P 500 which is somewhere like here. So the market, I denote it as M and with this esoteric here. So if we use this market portfolio here in our regression, we have already a systematic error here in, in this uh, factor. So if here is a systematic misprice or is, if here is a systematic error going on, uh, which is sort of this delta, then this has an impact, of course, on the estimated alpha here. So this, our estimated alphas are polluted by, by this difference here. So actually, if we get alphas that are positive or highly negative, it, it could simply be a result of this systematic error that we have in our market factor going on. That's why we can actually not really test our cap M. So we have to assume that actually our market factor really measures what it should, which is the optimal portfolio here, but it actually it doesn't. Because ex post data generates higher, uh, a higher sharp ratio for the optimal portfolio than our market proxy. Yeah. And if we re remember the Farman French three factor model or the Farman French five factor model, similar arguments hold there as well because they write actually even in the paper that they are risk factors. The five factors are proxies for some underlying source of risk. But proxy means it's, it's not the real risk, but something in between, something that should measure the risk, but there's an error going on. So actually, we cannot even test the Farman French five factor model. But what we can, of course, do is we can compare different models and then we can make an argument about where is the alpha lower and higher. So, of course, we can benchmark different models against each other, but it's difficult to make, an, to make a strong argument about whether or not the CAPM holds because we actually we don't know what is the real market factor. So any questions so far? So before we start with the real deal, we would like to go through how to upload about the data that we use in this course. So if you, it depends on which MATLAB version you actually use. Uh, this, this program is uh, developed all the time, and I had also different versions on my computer. I had, I had, this is now how we would handle the data if you use the MATLAB version from 2008. And uh, I don't know who of you have already managed or organized, let's, let's say organized the MATLAB version. If not, it's maybe time to get started. So slowly but surely, and we were discussing different possibilities to how to manage that. Yeah. So just, 
just do what you are supposed to do so, so that you can get started with everything because as I told you already when you um, don't, don't work continuously here then it becomes in the end too much and you might get, uh, get confused. So if you have the 2008 version um, this is how it looks like. Yeah, you make double click and then MATLAB starts and then you have the command window here and then if you would like to upload data first of all you have to know where, where you have your data file that you use and then you go on file import data and I have it here I have it I had it at this point in time in my folder MATLAB lectures and I call it data simply the Excel file is, Excel file is, is called data then this pops up when you then double click yeah, and then it gives us here different uh, icons and you have to you, we just want to have uh, the, the data file, so we have to click away um, the first and the second one, the call head and the text data. We don't need that, so we just want the data. So, like here. Yeah. And then you push, push the finish button, and then this data, data appears or appears in your workspace. Yeah. We have the command window where we basically write the code, and then we have uh, the workspace here and then you can make some definitions yeah, how, you, how you define the data and then everything that you define here in the command window pops up in the workspace as well. So everything is stored unless it's overwritten later on. So everything that you do here appears here as well. And that's actually in all of the MATLAB versions the same thing. So this is now the 2013 version and I think older, uh, later versions, they basically are very similar to that one here. So this, this is even easier. You can go, there's an import data button even, but you just have to push. And then you just have to give the right path here. So again, you have to know where you have stored the data. Then you, then you look it up. And I had it here in this uh, Cloud Projects 48 industry portfolios, and there I had a huge amount of data, the different Excel files, and then here I can decide which one I want to, I want to have, and then I chose 30 industry portfolios, double click, and then MATLAB connects me to this next page here where I can define what of this data matrix of this Excel file actually I would like to import here, so then I can make adjustments, e uh, sorry, MATLAB gives it a name, uh, industry portfolios, often the name that you have given also in the Excel file will, will, uh, will appear here. Then you have to click the matrix button. If you click column vectors, which is the first choice here, then you have, depending on the, on the data set, like millions of, 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 of vectors in your workspace, but we don't want that. We just want one big matrix. So we, push, we click the matrix button here, and then we would push uh, import this, this, this green button here, and then MATLAB would just import this data into the workspace, yeah, which, which then appears here. If you want to change the name of that initial data file, you can do right click and then rename, and then you can call it whatever you want, X, A, capital B, whatever, or simply data. And what we will learn on the way is we will not use the command window here, but we will operate with the script. So we will push the script, new script button, then we will write everything into the script, and then once we are ready with everything, then we just copy it into the command window and, and run the code after we are ready. Otherwise we have to do everything over and over again once we made a mistake and we don't want that. So then, if I have this data matrix here and I, and I plug it into the command window and I push the enter button, then MATLAB would spit me out what it is. So now it spits me out uh, in every column, every column that is in this data matrix. Yeah? So that's why usually after we give a command, a comment in MATLAB, we, we write a colon with this this sign here. 
if we do that, if we write here something, we define something, we de maybe we define a new matrix or something, and then we add this colon here, then it, it tells MATLAB that it should not execute this uh, command. Yeah? So it, it should not give us what we have defined here. If we don't do that and we would push the enter button, it would always spit us out what we have written here. So, and we don't want it, we would get confused then. So that's why we always add this colon after each comment usually. Yeah? Unless we would really want to know what's going on in the data. So as input data, it's the same data that I also was using last term. So I use real stock market data. I download data for the Swedish stock market. Yeah. The data matrix contains in the first column 215 observations of the Swedish leading index, which, which is the OMX30, Stockholm. And in the columns 2 to 15 of this, of this matrix, of this data matrix, we have different stocks. Uh, so the, basically one of the biggest stocks in the Swedish economy, like Electrolux, uh, Assa, Atlaskopko, Hietinge, H&M, SCB, SCA, SQF, and so on and so forth. So I, initially I was using like daily data and then I was adjusting this data for different stock splits and then I compounded, given this data, I compounded the weekly, uh, the monthly returns and data series starts in 95, but that's maybe not so important for you to know. Yeah? It's just the way how I constructed this, this uh, data sample for illustrative purpose for this lecture here. Then in the last column, in the column 16, I have also the corresponding risk-free rate, which is in Sweden, the reporenta. And of course, if you want to compound the excess returns, we have to subtract the reporenta from each of these gross returns here. Yeah? But this is what we will do step by step then during the lecture. But this is just for you to know about the data and uh, everything that we do here. It's a very small data set, of course, you know, just 15 stocks or whatever and a uh, short time window, but it's enough for our purposes, you know. Because everything that we do here, if you can easily extend, and you, will easily, and you will do that also in your term paper, to the S&P 500, to data from the S&P 500, and you have much more stocks to deal with. So everything that we do here in the small, you know, we, you can easily extend to much bigger data sets. Yeah? And that's also the purpose here of this course. Yeah? So, because, you know, Also, when you when you write your master thesis and so on and so forth, I mean, and you have a huge data set, then if you have only one time series, or let's say up to ten time series, or maybe a dozen time series, it it might be sufficient to work with with e views, or some some other kind of, of or SPSS or whatever program you can choose from. But if you have many many assets, many many stocks, if you have like 500, 600, 700 stocks, then it becomes infeasible with students and EVs, it takes ages. So that's why we use MATLAB or R yeah, in order to handle greater data sets. And moreover, if you work with uh, tick data, so you have like a billions of, of observations, I mean, it's, it's simply not possible to do that in, in EVs or in this sort of standard programs. These programs are more for like SPSS and so on. This is, this is more programs maybe for other type of social science, yeah, where, where you have, when you do research in psychology or something, where you have maybe 150 people in, in, a, in, a, in a data set, then this might be sufficient to do that. But if you have stocks and you have tick data and you have 30,000 stocks and you have like 1 billion observations for each of the stocks, it becomes infeasible. So you have to do it in a more powerful program. Yeah. And when you work at the, at the company, uh, you usually nowadays also use a lot this uh, SQL, for instance. Also other programs, but, but SQL is, is more like a basic program also where you can handle even bigger data sets as, as in MATLAB. But it works slightly different, so. Yeah, so any, any questions concerning this? Just to give you like a, like a brief overview about the data that I'm using here in this course. And uh, yeah, now we can get started with our lecture content. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. That's a PDF file. Let me see how, how good you can see it from, from behind. Yeah. Well, I guess you're young and you have good eyes, right? So <laughs> otherwise, I guess you have it anyways on your computer. Yeah, we know from Econometrics 1 that we have uh, to meet some assumptions. In order to get started, we have to have some assumptions. And I told you also in the introductory meeting that uh, it's, it's important here to, to get a grip of the basics because only when you understand the basics, you also know what happens if some of the assumptions are violated. For instance, as we discussed now a couple of times, um, I mean, here and also during the RF RFM course, what happens, for instance, when we do not measure the market factor, but if we have an error going on. So then it has obviously an impact on the estimated uh, parameters in our model. So, and whenever you run a project, when you are working at a bank or at an investment company or whatever you do, and you have a project going on and you have to report your results to, to your manager and you make wrong inference and this, 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 this might be very expensive uh, and this, it, this can be very dangerous for your position in the aftermath. Yeah? So it's important that you know what you do, that you have a good argument for, for what you do and if you, have, uh, if you just have the wrong t-statistics for instance you might say okay we, I have a great strategy here, we should run that, we would uh, earn so much money, and then in the end of the day it was wrong because the statistics were wrong. Then you end up in trouble. So that's why you have to know what to do. That's why it's important that you, that the, that you have a good fundament. So and most of the time we will use the OLS framework, ordinary release squares, and we know this already from Econometrics, so we have some assumptions here. The first assumption is that we have a linear model that the point estimates the, the parameters are linear, then they are, they are not squared or something, they are linear ingoing, and also our regressors, they are linear. Yeah. What we also assume is that the parameters are constant. This assumption we can already challenge because we have seen in the beginning of the lecture the, the graph, the evolutions of the stock index and of certain stocks, we have al al already seen that this assumption can be easily challenged, yeah? but for now we assume that the parameters are constant as well and that no variables are missing. Even this assumption we can challenge, okay? Because if the cap M is not right, then there are probably some variables missing. So probably even this assumption can be challenged, but in the OLS framework, we usually have this, this assumption as well. Yeah? So there are no variables missing, the parameters are constant, and we have a linear model. In matrix notation, I have given it here. So if we just write it a little bit more in detail, in matrix notation, our, our y vector, in this case, Well, what we have is, in, in our case, we have the excess returns of S at i at time t1. Then the second element are the excess returns of S at i at time t2. And the last element are the excess returns of S at i at time capital T. So our y is a t by one vector. Mm. What's our x? If we assume the cap M is true, we would have here the, the excess returns of the market factor at time t is 1. Second element would be the excess returns of the market factor at time t is 2. And in the, the last element would be the excess returns of our market factor at time capital T. Yeah. And if you would test the cap M, 
we would even add a constant term, which is a vector of ones, then you would have even ones here. And then the, this whole matrix would be a two by capital two by uh, capital T by two matrix. That's our X, our regressor matrix. And if you would deal with the Farman French three factor model, we would have here two more additional vectors. Uh, we would have a vector of uh, the, the uh, size factor, yeah? and we have, would have an additional vector here of the HML factor, of, of, the, of the value factor. Yeah? But in our case, we start with, with the cap M, and actually we start by assuming the cap M is all right, and we don't need an inter inter intercept term, and then this matrix is a simple T by one vector. Yeah. And then our U is, is an error vector, so each corresponding element has a systematic part and uh, an error part, so we would have here U or E, I think it's E, it, it doesn't actually matter, but it's UI is the error at time one of S at I, UI two is the error of S at I at time two, and the last element in this vector is the error of S at I at time capital T, and of course it has the same dimension, it's a T by one vector. It has a T, it has, a, it needs to have the same dimension as our excess return vector, yeah? And then our beta vector, uh, again, if we would have in, an intercept term included, our, then this would be t, t by two, and our beta vector would be, would capture the alpha, would be the estimated alpha, and the estimated beta one, or simply the estimated beta. Yeah. And then our, uh, this is of course a two by one vector, because it must match the dimension of our X matrix, yeah? And again, in case we do not include the intercept term, then this guy here would be simplified, yeah? Then we would have just the beta of S at I, and this is a one by one, it's just a scalar, it's just a, just a number, right? And this matrix here would be just a T by one vector. Yeah, and in the Farman French, let's say five factor model, and we would include even an intercept term, then this guy here would be t by six, right? And this would be a six by one vector, which measures the exposures against all of, all of the factors, in, including the intercept term. So we can easily take this as a point of departure and expand this, this model, de depending on which asset pricing model, which uh, we use as the, X, as the X matrix, yeah? So our asset pricing model is denoted by the X, X matrix, by our regressors in this case. Yeah? So that's the way how it looks in matrix notation. Then we can also have yeah. the equal sign. Is this clear to everybody? Could be pretty much straightforward, right? So then we have some more assumptions. We have uh, the assumption that of strict exogeneity. So this actually means that our error terms, or that our, in our case, our firm-specific risk, or, or our firm-specific component of, of, the, of the return vector here, of our excess returns, our firm-specific component should be uncorrelated or orthogonal to what happens with the market factor. Now, this is basically what it means. Or you can also think about it that this is random, this is not. This is given, this is predetermined. And these guys here are therefore uncorrelated. And you can ask, you can wonder, does it make sense? Does it make sense to assume that our firm-specific component 
or part of the return is unrelated to what happens in the market? Does, uh, does it make sense? I think in, in our case, this assumption is reasonable because why would, if we have many, many stocks, if we have like uh, 10 thousands of stocks in, in our asset universe, why would, would one single company have an, in, have an impact on the whole market? Right. But it's, 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 it's somehow in, intuitive clear that the, that the bigger guy here, our market, market factor, could have an impact on the stock. The market has an, the market has an impact on, on the single stock, but the single stock does not have an impact on the whole market. Okay. Then we have next, as the next assumption, the rank condition. So our regressor matrix, we have T, time series observations, and N denotes in this case the number of, of risk factors. Yeah? So if we have N risk factors, in this case we have just, just one, this, this is a one vector, so in this case it's, it's obvious. But if we have, let's say, six, six risk factors, and capital T observations, then the rank of this matrix should be six. Yeah? It's always the smaller number. If, if we have a T by N and N is larger than, uh, and T is larger than N, then the rank of, of our matrix is assumed to be N. It must be exactly N, actually, because if the rank is smaller than N, we cannot invert this matrix here. We know this from matrix algebra, right? So the, the inverse of a matrix is only defined if, if the matrix has full rank. So if, if we have the Farmer and French, let's say, six, a five factor model, and, and one of these risk factors would be a perfect linear combination of the other factors, then this assumption here would be violated and we couldn't even use this model. We could not even estimate the parameters. So in best case, what you would like to have is that all of these risk factors are orthogonal. They should be uncorrelated actually. In best case, all risk factors are uncorrelated. But in real life, we know that the risk factors are indeed correlated. And we know actually from the RFM course, if you remember, that the value factor, if you use the five factor model, and we have the value factor, the, the value factor becomes insignificant once we control for the investment factor. The, the beta loading is, is one, or 1, or 1.04, which means that the, the return evolution of the value factor is completely, is fully explained by the evolution of the value, uh, of the investment factor. So therefore, the value factor becomes redundant and it's almost, it's almost perfectly correlated. So the correlation is something like, uh, what was it, 0 0.75 or something. So it's not one, but if it, if it would be one, we couldn't even estimate the parameters, so, but it's, it's, it's highly correlated. So and then we have what we call, or what we remember from Ecometrics 1, we have this multicollinearity problem. So the higher the multicollinearity or, or the higher the correlation among the regressors, the more polluted the t statistics become and the less useful actually. Because uh, some, some point estimates can become or could indicate that some of the risk factors are insignificant, but actually they are not. But because we have a lack of observation or because we have a lack of information, we cannot break the correlation here between our, between our regressors. So that's the general problem of multicollinearity. That's why in, in the best case, we, we would have risk factors that are orthogonal, that are, unco that are uncorrelated, because then the t-statistics would have the highest information content. Yeah. So the final assumptions here are that our error terms, these guys here, they have the same distribution. Each of them 
is normally, normally distributed. Yeah. So this guy here is normally distributed with mean zero and variance sigma squared. The second guy has the same distribution, normally distributed with mean zero and sigma squared, and so on and so forth. So all of our error terms here have the same distribution. And moreover, they are uncorrelated. And of course, this is simply a matter of assumption because if the guys are normally distributed with mean zero and sigma squared, then of course they need to be uncorrelated as well in the, in the cross section. Which is the assumption here that the covariance between the error or the idiosyncratic part or return part of uh, ui and uj is zero for i unequal j. Yeah. And this is here in the last equation in 5b summarized. Yeah. So we can, of course, then say, okay, if we have the huge if you consider all these equations together, or all, all these items here together, then the distribution is, uh, has a zero vector, of me, which is the mean vector. And the covariance matrix is simply an identity matrix, which, which has on the main diagonal all the sigmas, the sigma squares. And, and zeros everywhere else. So that's the distribution of our error vector. Yeah? The error vector is distributed with mean zero, multivariate normal, and this is the covariance matrix. Because the sigma, the all the items have the same, all the random variables have the same variance, but are uncorrelated, the covariance matrix looks like that of the multivariate distribution. So next we need to think about now we want to know, so let's assume the cap M is true. And we don't have an intercept term, there is no systematic mispricing going on, and the whole evolution of our stock returns are simply explained by the loadings against the market factor. Uh, so we have just a beta that matters here, and we, need, and we have the excess returns of the market factor as well in our model. Now, in, in this framework here, this is our y, that's our x, and that's our u in math exploitation. Yeah. So our model looks then something like this, y is x times beta plus u. Yeah, this, this, is, this is exactly what we have here. Yeah? u is x times beta plus the error term. So, but from this equation, we, we can see that we can um, put this term here on the, left, on the left hand side, and what we have is that the error term is then a function which was, looks like this, it's, it's, it's the y minus x times beta. Yeah. And in the OLS framework, what we do is we want to minimize the errors here, the error terms. So we square, it's called, it's called least squares because we want to minimize the sum of squared residuals. So this gives us the residual vector, and we would multiply it by itself. 
So we, we would need the scale-up product. So, so what, we, what we do is we want to minimize this, ex this expression here, uh, which, which, which is the sum of the squared residuals. Yeah? This guy here times itself. So we have to transpose this guy. This is t by 1, transpose is 1 by t, times itself is t by 1, so what comes out is a scalar. This squared times plus this squared, and so on and so forth. So we square each of the elements and sum them up. So this is also what we can write. So we can now just replace our u vectors with what we have here. So what we get then is y minus x times beta transposed times itself. Yeah. So what we know is from matrix algebra, so we can put the, tra the transposed sign into the parentheses, and then this changes here, the order changes. If the product, if the matrix product is, uh, if we have a matrix product, then the order of those guys changes. So what we have is then y transposed minus beta transposed x transposed times y minus x times beta. So and then we can multiply it out simply. That is y transposed times itself minus beta transposed x times x times beta. Or we can maybe just, we can just first put, we can first multiply just the elements which comes first, which is the y here, right? So then we have to, let's see, we have this times this. Then we have the second times this, and then we have this times this, which is beta transposed x times y, and then we have plus, <coughs> minus times minus plus, and then this expression times this expression, which is beta transposed x transposed, and then x times beta. Yeah. So this is here a scalar. This is one, t one by one, so we can, we can simplify this. which is simply two times beta transposed x times y plus this term here, which is beta transposed x times uh, x transposed times x times beta. So now we also want to minimize this expression here with respect to our beta, yeah? because this is what we want to get. We want to get the beta parameter. So we minimize this expression with respect to beta, so we take the derivative. And if we take the derivative, what remains is 2 times this guy here. It must be transposed. Plus 2 times the first beta here goes away if we take the derivative. And this becomes equal, equal to 0. So we can take away this 2, and then we can open this door here as well. And then we can bring this on the other side. And the last thing that we have to do is, once we have, once we have done that, we have to bring this part here on the other side, and then we have our final parameter estimator. So we have to take the inverse of this guy here times x, transpo uh, times x transposed 
y. So that's our final expression, and it, it gives us the, the, the market sensitivity of our excess returns, which is, not, which is our y vector here, depending on the, or con conditioned on the market factor. Yeah. And we can do the same thing for all our stocks y. Or we can have different, different y vectors here. So if, if uh, we have the excess, if we have the excess returns yi, then we would have the corresponding beta estimates i. So and, we, this is, and this is the same thing that we do, but luckily we don't have to do it uh, by hands, but we can use the, use the program and it, and it would give us basically for all of our stocks the same estimate. So we formulate a for loop basically, and then we store all of our estimated betas into a result vector. And our, our program does this automatically for all of our stocks. Yeah. And if we now think about it, in our framework, our, our X matrix is nothing else but it's simply like a vector. It's nothing else but this guy here. So our X transposed X inverted is nothing else but simply We have to sum, T is 1 to capital T, of the market factor squared. Yeah. That's our x transpose x inverted. So in, in our case, this guy here, this, this part of, of the equation is the sum of squared market returns, and it's and we invert it so it's in the it goes into the denominator. Yeah. And the first part or the the uh, second part here, x transposed times the excess returns of our y vector here, of our asset y, it's nothing else but. Uh, The sum from T is 1 to capital T of the excess returns of the market factor times the excess returns of asset I times T. Yeah. So that's basically what we have. Yeah. And that's our asset I. So, and this guy times this guy here gives us the corresponding sensitivity of the asset I against the market factor in this framework. Yeah. So that's basically what stands behind all that. And I have it also written here in this uh, draft you can see it here also on the slides, the main steps here in this derivation. Yeah. So, and in the first uh, exercise that we have here in our script, so the exercise is as follows. Assume the cat M holds. This is what we have done so far. Yeah. Estimate the following model and store the betas in the result vector. So, in, and this is exactly our model here in, for the first exercise. Yeah? We have the excess returns of, of our stocks and our stock universe, and we simply re regress them on the, on the excess returns of the market factor. Yeah? That, that's our simple re regression model. Yeah? And uh, in this equation, I wrote here furthermore, uh, yit denotes the return of stock i, which can be Volvo, SSRB, H&M, and so on, at time t, and market t denotes the stock market return at time t. Parameter beta measures the exposure to changes in the stock market index, 
and UIT denotes the residuals. RF denotes the risk-free rate, which is, which is in this case, again, the repo at time t. So, how does it then work in MATLAB? Now, first of all, I, I have to take this away now. So, here you have to write uh, a little bit faster in this course. At least faster as in the RFM course. time. So Peter had it. X prime or X transpose X inverted times X transpose Y. So according to our assumptions, this we assumed is given. That, that's not random. The market factor is not random. Yeah, in, in, in our framework, this is strict. We assume that the regressors, and this is in our case the market factor in regress form, is strict exogenous. So this is given. It comes from heaven. Okay? This is random. The, the excess returns of S I are random. They do not come from heaven. So, because this is random, this part, and our point estimate, our market beta, is a linear function of, of its excess returns, which is random, beta is random as well. It's a, it's a, a linear combination of a normally distributed random variable, therefore, beta is also random and it's normally distributed as well. But we will come back to that later. So now remember, we have our Excel sheet here. Excel is usually green, right? So that's why I use green color here as well. And we have in the first column of our Excel file, the first column here has the OMX30 returns. Uh, this is our data file. It's, it's called data. Yeah. So data is a huge matrix. Well, it's not huge, but you know. So the second column, column vector here, uh, uh, the gross returns, or the, yeah, the gross returns of stock one the third column are the gross returns of stock two, and so on. The 15th column, so this is 15, this is one, this is two, this is three. 15th column is the gross returns of stock 14. We have 14 stocks in our sample. And the last column in our Excel file, which is the 16th column, contains the repo renta, which is RF, our risk-free rate in our case, yeah, because we operate with the Swedish economy. Maybe next year I take the Finnish economy, let's see. Yeah, doesn't really matter. So I denote now what, what, what happens now here in, the, in this file. So x is equal, so I write in the command window or in the script, x is equal to data, x is equal to data 
this double point here, and one. And remember now, we have this colon here in the end, otherwise MATLAB would spit us out a column vector. And remember also that we have rows here, and we have 215 rows. So this whole matrix here is 215 by 16, right? We have 215 rows and 16 columns. So I denotes the row dimension and J usually denotes the dimension of columns. So I is 215 and J is 16. But it depends on your notation. Sometimes some people change it. Yeah, but you have to know what you do. So you have to know what is the column and what is the row dimension. Yeah. Once you know that, you can play around with how, how, however you want. So if you write this in the command window, well, what does that mean? It means define x as, take the first column, yeah? again, this is the, j is the column dimension, take the first column and all rows from this file, from, from this matrix denoted as data. So this is our data, our Excel file, yeah? our data matrix, and it, and it should allocate, it would grab the first column vector here, and then the first column vector is the omics 30 returns, right? And it should take all rows, so the whole column here, all 215 observations. So the x axis then, of course, a 215 by one vector. Yeah? It's just the first column vector here of our, of our matrix, and, and this column vector is the omics 30 So the second command, capital Y, yeah? Now we have to define our input matrices so that we can run our point estimates here for all of our stocks here, yeah? So what is Y? Y is defined as data, and what does it say? Again, we want all of the rows, so all time series observations, and from column two to 15. So then, of course, we know from column 2 to column 15, we have the gross returns of all stocks. And each column are the gross returns of, it, of our 14 stocks. Yeah. So now we define our Y matrix. And here we have, all, uh, we have our 14 stocks. So Y has then the dimension 215 times 14. Because we have 215 times these observations, and we have 14 stocks. And the 14 stocks are in column 2 to 15 of our data file. So RF, very simple of course, then finally, RF is the last column of our data file, which is uh, the 16th file. And again, it should give us uh, double point means take all of the rows and where, okay, from column number 16. So again, data uh, RF is then uh, 215 by one vector. Mm -hmm. what, what happens next here, it defines how many observations we have, capital T should be length of Y. So length of Y, length means MATLAB counts now the number of observations here. Yeah? And it gives you, in this case, the longest number of observations. Of course, we know uh, our Y has 15 observations in the column space, but 215 in, in rows. But if you write length of the matrix, it gives us always the, it gives us the longer or the, the, the larger number. So in this case, if we write T, should be the length of capital Y, then it, then it gives us 215. T would be, in this case, 215. We can also write T should be length of RF, because RF, we know, is also 215. It's a 215 by one vector, and small x is also a 215 by one vector, so we could also write easily here length of x or length of RF, or we simply write T should be equal to 215. 
whatever. Yeah. But of course, if we make it dependent on the data matrix, then we can, if we can, once we upload a different data matrix, it would be automatically defined. Yeah. So we can basically, we, we can write a code in a way that we just, that we have to adjust as little input parameters as possible, and we can upload any data matrix, and MATLAB would spit us out basically the corresponding point estimates. Yeah, that's basically how you do effective coding. Yeah. You want to have as little work as possible once you have different data sets that you upload in your program. So K, capital K, defines the number of stocks that we have in our stock universe. And I said already we have 14 stocks. Yeah. So capital K is 14 in our example. There are some meta versions or some packages where you can actually, we have the row command where you can then write something like, uh, then you could define K as let's say, row, rows of y transpose or something. You know, y transposed is 14 by 215, right? So y is 215 by 14, and if you transpose it, it becomes 14 by 215. And the rows would be, in this case, 14. The rows of y transpose is 14, right? So there are some packages uh, that basically have this command rows, but uh, this, the, standard pack, the standard method version doesn't have it, so we cannot use that command. But yeah. And moreover, this is like a course for like beginners, okay? So this is a course for people who have not worked with programming yet. So this is, this is not a course for people who have uh, already good skills in, in programming and so on and so forth, because um, you can always Im improve codes and you can use tools like vec vectorization and all this stuff. And, but this is something that you learn, in my opinion, at, an, at a later stage. So in the beginning, if you are not familiar with coding, and the most intuitive way is that you, you use the, what you learned in econometrics and plug it into plug it into a code. Yeah, you you somehow you, you should learn how to use econometrics for your for dealing with your research problems. Yeah, it's not about writing the perfect code that has the fastest uh, uh, that can do everything in sort of milliseconds. Yeah, because I mean the programs are already super fast, so you don't have to bother about uh, saving some time in order if you make some big improvements in the code. Yeah? Of, course, of course, it's possible. And uh, all of these codes that I will give you and that we, hear, and that we will discuss here can be improved a lot. Yeah? I'm completely aware of that, but that's not a, pro that's not a, course, uh, that's not a course for a, um, like an advanced programmer. Yeah, it's, a, it's a course for someone who knows the basics of econometrics and who wants to apply the basics of econometrics in a computer program in order to deal with some research questions related to finance, okay? This is, this is the course about. So just for, for your knowledge, I mean, there are always some, some people who have already some pre-knowledge and that's good, but uh, I would like to have all of you here in the boat. Um, yeah. Then I guess that may be enough for today. And then tomorrow we will continue with the first exercise here and we go in, in more detail through that. And yeah, let's continue from there.